Welcome to this fourth episode of APL Notation as a Tool of Thought podcast. Um, I'm Adam Potsevsky and with me I have Richard Park. Hello. Today we are going to talk about a high-level structure of APL programs and um, how to well design your APL code and think about your APL code. Because I guess last time we, we went pretty deep into the differences between the three functional what do we call them? Functional forms? I don't know. Ways of writing functions in Dialog APL. Um, and I guess... Oh, we also talked about that, the APL 360 thing, which is a diagram that is a structure of a program. It's also a way of writing code. So those two things are often thought of by programmers, I guess, as one in the same, right? As how do you write... How do you structure your code... And it's thought of in terms of functions of code or functions that you're writing in code because it's code all the way down, right? If, if everything is functions, not every programming language has everything being a collection of functions. Oh, true. There are, there are other things as well. I mean, maybe the most classic thing would be scripts, which now we even have that in APL. Right. Um, scripts. And they're not really functions as much as uh, sequences of instructions on what to do. Yeah, which can be either like yeah. expressions, APL expressions, one line, or whole function definitions. Don't think it's much else, really. Well, it's definitions of stuff. They can be functions or other stuff. It can be namespaces and classes and whatever. Not. Yeah. And then you can go and, and use that. Anyway, how do you actually use this? So you want to write some kind of application. You want to write some, some thing that does something. Um, <laughs> and... <laughs> Yeah, I, mean, I think uh, once you're experienced with it, you might not think so much about it. But for somebody who's new to APL, how do you how do you begin? Right? You sit down. You've got this. You got your REPL, your APL session open, and it's all blank. There's nothing there. How do you start? Even how are you going to structure this? Um, you have some kind of idea in your head, and now you want to express this. You can use it. You can start top down. You could st go from the bottom up. How do you even think about the whole structure? So uh, this is maybe a contrast between like, well, oh, there's so many parts to this. That's what makes this hard. It's well, part, just get started. Because some, well, because <laughs> on the one hand, it's the way I do a lot of things is there's like the problem, and I can write the code to like solve the problem in one way. And in that is already so many assumptions baked in, like how am I representing the pieces? Which if we're talking about in the session is like your APL arrays or your variables that pass to the functions. And then that influences a lot um, how you write the functions. And then after that is usually when I think, okay, how can I factor this into something that I can then either use as part of some other APL code or uh, put as a whole system. But then on the other hand, you can think ahead of time, like, okay, I know I'm going to be deploying this in this place, which means it needs to have these hooks, these endpoints or this feature or th this way of accessing it. Am so an, a, an API, you, st an you, API, you start right. with the API and then say, okay, this is the transformation of data that comes in that I want to make. And then it goes out via some kind of API as well at the other end. And that API so that, can be a screen, right? So those those are the two ways. There's no other, there are other ways of thinking of coming to these conclusions. Like you have the way that you've solved the problem, restricting your internal representation of the different pieces because that's how you thought of it when you solved the problem. And that's like, you know, the rank and depth and shapes of your APL arrays and then the functions that apply to them and the same thing for your result, the kind of type information of your result, if you like. 
And then there's the API side, which is like, how is my user going to be accessing this? I don't think I, I, think I sometimes start, or often just start the other way from the very bottom. There's a core algorithm somewhere that I want to implement, the core transformation. And I'm not so concerned at that point about how it hooks together with the world outside. Not Right, right. That was, the, that was what I was trying to describe in the first example, yeah. Okay, so it's, and then so and then I I start by building some APL function that can uh, do that transformation, and then I build out from there to to deliver the result somehow to where it needs to go, and to take input somehow to for what it needs, if anything at all. Um, yeah. But yeah, but you could also start with the the API. But then the question is, do you first decide on the uh, data representation at least there in apl we're lucky because <laughs> you know, what kind it's of an array yeah it's an array <laughs> no but it's like i said like you know what's the so you've got this core algorithm maybe there's already an implementation of it you're just grabbing or you're just implementing ah. it based on some like text description but in that when you've done that you've now decided on the the representation in the sort of center this like core level what's going into your algorithm function and what's coming out of that i i think that can be fluid for a while i'll often change my core representation of data as i develop the middle parts which is mm. why i would hold off on creating the plumbing for coming in and sending back out again i don't want yeah, to lock well, myself down to that because really at that level it's just whatever's convenient for the thing you're plugging it into and then transform from that representation these days you can imagine like json in a web api or something transform from that into the thing that i found convenient for my core algorithms purpose um that's like the middle plumbing right but you might find a better algorithm if you structure your data differently or you could find more efficient right ways so, it's, so it's so it's better well better I feel like it's probably more common to think from the inside out. You can always write data munging, uh, right. transforming from one representation to another code at some point. Okay, so so let's say you got your. Well, that's. Um, sorry? Oh, yeah. Uh, sorry, yeah, yeah. No, I think <laughs> I was about to say what you're about to say. That's the concepts, right? Yeah. So it's let's say you got your, your data structures about. down, which is obviously an array, but the question is where do things. You go into the array or multiple arrays and so on. Um, and you got you have an idea about the plumbing that needs to be done on the way in, on the way out. But now you actually start writing some functions. And obviously you could write everything as a giant monolithic thing. Or a one big Yeah, one big tradfin. Tradfin. That's what it's going to be. Um and then there's the the opposite extreme is probably doing everything as we call the bag of functions, mm. even tiny little tacit ones, possibly, yeah. and then everything in between, medium-sized functions. I I personally like medium-sized everything that's not <laughs> trivial utility functions. I would say, uh, if a function doesn't fit on the screen, then that's a problem for me. Yeah, I I am inclined to agree with that. Um... And then it's a question of what exactly what is the job of this function? So some functions need to do grunt work of, you know, the user is trying to do something. Are they trying to do this or that or this or that? And then it takes various pathways through the code and then comes out at the end with some kind of result. And for that, a Tradfin is what I would go by with because it has all the control structures to do the work. Um, and, and yeah. I mean, so it's a pretty sensible way to go that way. So you're saying at the top level of your like programs organization is a, there's a Tradfin or some right. Tradfins right, dealing with this. I, yeah, I think generally you someone... only one really, hmm. it's just one top level run function, the main, the body function, and then, and, and it should preferably be concise as well and then all its actual implementation of algorithms is uh goes out to utility functions or helper functions to do that instead and the only 
reason to make it very long would be if there are a lot of different cases that are just independent of each other. So we'd have some giant select statement and then case this, case that, case this, case that. Um, and then it could be long because of that. But you don't need to see the entire function in order to understand what's going on. You could just say, oh, okay. We're going down to some sub part and then going in yeah, there. Right. But then each case will probably just be a single line that just calls some other function. function. Right, exactly. Um, the only other, other sort of thing in contrast to this that obviously we've seen, we, you can see examples of it. And I would like to like learn to try and do this properly in some cases i've just not really had the experience to actually do it is the and maybe it's only specific cases where it's super suitable i'm not sure where you're defining a bunch of functions and then your structure is actually just gluing those together if you can do proper functional composition but i tend so... to define them as i go along right so i'll i'll define some function some some large ish function on one of those cases that needs to be done if there's are more cases um and that's very specific for what exactly i'm trying to get done and it may be a defin if it's all pure and functional but there it might i might want to use the threadfin as well if it's uh should we say nasty stuff if i'm dealing with objects and so on you don't really don't want to do that in the defin. um but sometimes i need some small functions that could be useful in some toolkit or like in a library of helper functions i might it might never get to there they might just be, live here in my code base but if That's they're general funny. i'll break them out and give them a general name it was funny i watched uh i was wondering how to reconcile this because i watched a talk or maybe i watched half a talk recently um i think or well, maybe it's just a short YouTube video actually about naming things. And their argument was like, if you have a, if you have something called utils that has these sort of utilities, utilities in, then maybe it's a, you should think about, is that really where they belong or where do they actually belong? Meaning in a thinking, separate library, not in, in this code. No, base, they, but... I think they were arguing that for naming purposes, they should be living together in the context where you're going to use them. And I thought, what if you're using the same thing everywhere? Then the same utilities, it, you mean? Is it worse to have the other redefinitions everywhere? I don't, the problem is there was no specific, there were no, this person was, you know, computer, regular computer science background and there weren't, there didn't seem to be, I don't know if they had like actual examples, uh, shown of this. Okay. So, but so I agree. There's something a little ugly when I, when I do, uh, I guess at the top of your function, maybe you would copy the definitions into another name. You'd be like, I'm trying to think of an example, split gets hash hash dot utils dot split or something. Ew, I never do that. No. I mean, if what the path, if the path to where you're going to pick it up from is longer than the definition. The, just define them, it. Yeah, just define it. And <laughs> I don't have any dependencies. I don't like dependencies anyway. I, I think an example of higher code hmm. things, although that is somewhat artificially restricted by some old format that I'll be doing something about, is the get user command in Dalek 18.2. Hmm. Um, there, I wrote everything from scratch. There's no old code that I needed to deal with. There is an API I need to abide by, so I had to put my code into a single namespace or class, but the, no reason for that for the user command for the user command because of how the old user command system works although that will be changing um so it's a scripted namespace and it had to have certain interface functions that uh the user command framework then hooks into and it then the framework deals with input and output i just need to do my work on it um but then what i did was be because everything has to live in that namespace and it's then pretty big the namespace is about 500 lines by now i think right um then i used sections so these sections are these uh 
like control structures, they're basically like if one and then end if. <laughs> so you can collapse them in the editor and you can like, but they show up in the tree view as uh, of, of the namespace as sections and you can call them anything you want, even things that don't make sense syntactically. So basically colon section is like a comment. You yeah. Right. Anything you it's want like to a comment, but dialogue that the development environment knows about them. Yeah. And, Turns and your... yeah, I think they're nice to, to, um, navigate with around and then I put things inside though. So I, I structured my code here. I mean, I can show the code. You can see it's not a secret. Uh, as long as you speak it through for the listeners as well. Yep. Um, so it's, it's structured as these seven sections, uh, const for, for constants, errors for dealing with various types of errors. I think it's error messages and stuff. Um, and then interface and tests and types and, uh, the help system for the user command system. And then general utilities. I mean, if these are just labels, why yeah, not they're... give them full, why abbreviate the names? Because then I've managed to get them all to have the same number of characters. That was, <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It there's no reason. It could, be... could say error. It could say yeah, interface. It's just, it's just cute that it's they have... user command help. Yeah. There's cute. Although it's a shame because yeah. in the, in the interface we're looking at here, it's not a fixed, it's not a it's monospace font. font. So. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so and so that section that, that, uh, the utilities section right this that's yeah. what i'm talking about those are like little mostly one-liners or very few lines of code yes. things that are very general it could be used anywhere and it's nice because you can now access these uh just as they are as functions yeah, because as it's a section it's not a namespace so i can just use the name um, okay even i've got so for my advent of code I don't know if this is a really good way to do it. Although it's been working out pretty well. I have some things because you're commonly going to split on new lines. So you're going to split on, you want to chunk things into sections, passing your input sort of things. Right. So I've got a, a namespace with the kit, but that kit namespace has a function to initialize, to basically copy those names into the current one. Because <laughs> yeah. I'm using link, they don't get put, when I do that copy, they don't get put in, they're not right, copied right. all over my source code. But before I start the problem, it means I've got these things to hand. I don't have to redefine them every time or whatever. I wouldn't do that in a production system. No, it's because uh, you, you're trying to do advent of code on time, right? So I'm not actually things. trying to, but I'm trying to treat it as if I was. I can't. I'm not waking up early enough okay. in the UK to to actually compete. So, so I, I have these sections with these utilities. Funny enough, I've put some of the utilities apparently are a little bit more specific to what I'm doing. Um, but a lot of it is like compatibility layers. So you'll find things like we added the, which version was that? Uh, we added quad C, um, for, for case operations, uppercase, yeah. lowercase case folding. And before that we used to have this I beam eight, one, nine, I beam, and they have, they're slightly different in the calling convention. So whatever. Um, and then I, I use the appropriate one for the version. Um, you can see things like that. You can see, um, the array notation model has moved from being a part of link to standing on its own. So where exactly is it located? And so just create an interface for those things. Um, and then I, it's kind of a main function that I have that's it's written as the, as a defin, but really it's the kind of case statement. I don't know if it's really, oh, if, but you're doing it with guards you, or something. Yeah. It's just a bunch of guards and there's almost no code other than just guards and then calling some other function to do either calling some function or normalizing something and then starting over. So you'll have like, it will be recursive tail recursive, but okay. just, okay. If there's something missing or whatever, some, uh, then supply that and then start over and then it goes to a different case. So it's all just cases and that's the main, uh, the main function there. Um, All right. So the top level is just yeah, a sequence of cases, a little bit of normalization of the arguments of that, but I consider this a utility function, um, in, in here at least, cause it's just, it's just the controller that just branch out to where I need to go. It's not actually the top level call function because okay, that's so under the, interface. Right. Cause the interface is your API. It could yeah. also be called API. Yes. Um, and that's just 
Well, the, uh, the I in API stands for interface, so <laughs> <laughs> so I guess true. yes. Uh, I forget that sometimes. But it's not an apl application programming interface. It's the interface that, to that of uh, that um whatever you call it a brief uh, acronym is that acronym. It's not an acronym. Is it? Whatever abbreviation has been abused. Yeah, it just means the interface unbelief. now, doesn't it? Yeah, it's... it means interface in the sense of. Uh, a programmatic type thing function things calling each other as opposed to interface as a user interface yes which is different yeah that's true so but but here it actually is kind of both because and um, so i have a main function with the name of well it's get because the whole thing is get and that's that you can call if you load in get into your workspace then you can use the get function directly and it has a, like a nice interface um but if you're using it as a user command, then the user command system requires that uh, a function called run. And then run, as I've written it, it just takes the input. That's doing exactly that munging that you're talking about. It, take, it, take it, it does two things. It take, takes the input that comes from the user command system and then munges it until it becomes the right, argument, the, the right form of arguments to the main function, which is called get. Yeah, all right. Um, and that that I need to to do because I want the get function to be the main one you call if you're not using the user command interface. So it has to have a nice, uh, yes. a nice API for that. But the user command system, of course, doesn't know how to do it. And then it, another something else it does is some user interfacey thing. It it's because it can take a while to complete the operation. It starts printing dots to the screen. Uh, okay, and, and saying it's working if on it. If it's loading something that's quite large or downloading exactly. something from the internet so, or something, so it'll do that, and it sets up also to uh, a background thread to run to output that as it's working, and then also to stop it once it's done. So it's taking care of that, so, but it's not actually doing any of the work. It just you're just setting up the framework for doing that. Um, and then so the that's... get function, as I said, the main function again doesn't really do much or ever to work. It calls that utility operator actually underscore get which is the one that really that that then branches out to do all the different things that might need to be done and every single one of those things that need to be done and uh, is its own function and it, it might need so what get does is it it it's allows you to fetch stuff oh, hold on one second pages. i just want to stick up before you go deeper into yeah, yeah sure there's so one thing that that did sound important just then i want to reiterate and understand i'm understanding it or at least I think I do, is in theory, this core function that's doing stuff could know about whether things are taking a long time and decide to inform the user of that or what other things happen at that level. Like they, it could be, it, it could be aware of, or uh, it could be trying to give feedback, right? This, this sort of um, core API yeah, it, it could, but I would, there's a difference in how you're using it. If you're using it as a user command, that means you have an active human user at the keyboard that and that's, is probably interested in knowing that, oh, this is taking a while, but I'm still working on it. It hasn't hung yet. Yes. But I wanted to make it that if it's a function call, then it should be allowed to be a dependency of other tools and not all of a sudden clubber them with output. Exactly. I think it's a general good piece of advice in terms of like ah, that's program right. structure is to separate out this is a separation of concern i mean that the phrase is called separation of concerns but i think it's ambiguous enough that i've never found that on its own that useful it always has to be explained and in this case because sometimes it's like the job uh well, how am i phrasing this the problem is this tool, so the job is to get something. <laughs> the, um, something from somewhere. Yeah. You know, but the getting of the thing is different from the telling the user yes. about where you're at. Yes. And so those things have been separated. And, and, I think and also the, and, the, and, is and that important. is also separate from um, actually figuring out then what kind of thing is it, how are we going to deal with that? So those are the three layers. First layer is dealing with the user, the way that the user writes their command and telling them this is taking a while. Next yeah. level is um, getting ready, setting everything up to actually do the main job, but we're not doing any of the work itself yet. We, um, but it does things figuring like, out what 
form the arguments should be in yes but also handling things like it, it uses a temporary directory so cleaning that up making yeah, be right. before and after and uh and also it also deals with things like if you give it multiple arguments and then it will just loop through them and then join up the results so eventually. you can call this housekeeping yeah you could yeah housekeeping is, is nice and then finally we have the top the... level is reception where the user comes in <laughs> and then housekeeping <laughs> and then housekeeping before any, any of the work gets done make sure you start clean and then i go to the clean. to the operator actually in my case but that's yeah that's not so yeah. important which uh, is the kind of like the manager it doesn't do any of the job itself it just says if it's this case of this that needs to be done yeah so it, it analyzes the situation but doesn't do anything about it it just um delegates oh, it delegates the job. Yeah. yeah right um to that and then i've got a bunch of and i have that because it's here that i'm fetching various types of things so then i've got all the different types and that's got all the um there many of them are operators because they're practical to give additional types of arguments in yeah. um but effectively they're just functions um and then for each type this is, of this thing is type of thing you're bringing in because yes. get for people aren't familiar is a general purpose kind of development time utility for fetching code or data from outside of the APL workspace and bringing it in in a sensible form, whether that's function or namespace, you know, code definition for code, whatever form that might be, or, you know, you can get on a CSV file and it'll bring that in as a usually a nested matrix or something. I'm just spotting here a function that doesn't belong here. We've been talking about get it for a long be. time without <laughs> having said what get No, no, is. but this, but it's not so important, it. right? It's the structure here. Yes, no, there are no. all the different tasks that could be done, and then I have one function for each type of task that could be done, and it, whatever that might be, like you might have an application that where there's some menu system, and the user chooses to load or save or export or, uh, yeah, print or whatever. So each one of those would have their own. The own functions. I I spot here a utility function that's misplaced, but it doesn't matter because they're the same namespace. <laughs> and then each one of my functions that that right. deals with this are is itself only like a handful of lines, up to a dozen lines of of stuff. Yeah. Um, and they themselves will then call utility functions to get the work done. Yeah. Um. So they will often. I think this level. So we had. We had the 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 interface, the door into the hotel, so to say. Yep. Yep. Um, housekeeping inside, making sure that the entrance is nice and clean, and then we have the the man, manager or some whatever you want to call it, some person sitting at at the front desk and make sending people to the right floors, in the right rooms. Concierge. And then, yeah. <laughs> and then each one of those is itself a function, but those so, uh, those functions that are the specific tasks that need to be done and they will often look like they're written in a dsl they don't use a whole lot of primitives they use a lot mm. of words that kind of say what it is they do and the actual primitives are all the way pushed down to utility functions and and maybe some people will say that that's too much abstraction um there this is something i thought is a little not a rift in the apo community well no, it's, it's like it's, a difference in attitude attitudes between or yeah I, this is this is something we'll probably save for another episode or something something i get quite conflicted about a lot which is when some people argue that part of the appeal of apl and this is i think always true when you're doing algorithm kind of work is the ability to like write something terse it all fits on the screen you get the macro and micro micro view you can see both the structure of your entire code because all of the code is literally there on your screen and you can see the details because it's all written in terms of primitives and that's how the code actually works and you being able to see that at the same time is really useful when you're like developing something exploring things um trying to spot patterns to make better more useful abstractions later but it's something that yeah I, is not very commonly done in something like this which you consider application code where a lot of the steps like we've been making the analogy of this like ho managed hotel structure or whatever which is fairly useful in this case where that's happening and from our description earlier where we said like 
you have the thing where the user's going to call it and then the place where you're delegating down. I guess the thing is, it's just there's not loads of examples of that out in the... Uh, the videos that show off APL and the other bits of writing that talk about like the notation being this beautiful thing for expressing computations, I guess. All yeah, I've had that complaint as well. Maybe this is just how it is right now, and this is a step towards improving that. Like all those examples, these like little noodly examples. We haven't had to the, the input is in, you know, it's already there as some matrix or whatever. Advent of code, I guess, is quite kind of good because you have the passing step, at least. But you don't have the, the the examples are so small that you don't get to see this type of um, actual large structure of it. Code defense is the only extreme example that's like uh, a counter to this, right? Even yeah. that, I think, has changed since the thesis edition. In terms of like, it does probably have something analogous to this. Well, there's the user command, then there's like the functions that actually do the compiler passes. I think those are more separate than maybe they were at one point as well. Maybe we can go and have a look at that as well. That but I mean, I don't have a lot of, you might think that oh, because I'm pushing everything to, um, to Yeah, your low level is where the, DSL, the primitives but the, the, are. I don't have a lot of, or a lot of them here. We're talking Basically. about a, a bit over a dozen utility functions and all they do really because uh, I do use primitives inside my uh, my actual task being done functions. Um, all my utilities do really is just make the notation a bit nicer when there are things missing in the core APL language that I need to so that my code turns out nicer um, and not have to write the same phrases over and over. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit don't repeat yourself. Um... And it's a little bit just when it's a when it's an abstraction that helps you just see it kind of straight away. Well, it helps me think about it. Right? They, they, an example here is a very simple little defin that I wrote uh, yeah. called up, which is just open brace <laughs> omega dot hash hash close brace. That's it. That's the whole thing. But the difference there is how I think about things. I have a namespace reference coming to me, and I want to know what its parent is. So I, that's a function of the namespace. Or um, a method in the uh, OOP. Could it well, be? Well, but see, but here's the difference. Let's say, I, if, let's say if I want to know if two, if two namespaces are siblings. Right? Yeah. So I could do namespace A dot hash hash matches namespace B dot hash hash. But it... <laughs> But it's going. much more the way I would think about it is match over up. Yeah. Match over parent. Because then they, I can but use the notation is, for that. Type. Yeah, parent or yes. notation, whatever you want to call it. Um, and yeah, the, the same thing here is uh, I have a function called ex, which is matches like quad ex, which removes things from the symbol table. It erases names. Yeah. Um, but the the thing is that we might need to tell the link system that keeps track of synchronization about it. And so in which case do I need to, uh, I'll to tell call quad the X button. for the workspace yeah, or so call link expunge? I need to do both. I both both need to yeah, because link expunge will not uh will not remove it if it's not part of some linked thing. Yes. And right. quad EX, the built in thing, will not uh notify link to update the file system accordingly yep. so i need to do both or in one or the other in which whatever case um and and that's inconvenient to have to write a whole bunch of code every time i need to remove something so i just wrap that and cut. okay i've got a new primitive for that and then there are things like cutting and joining texts cutting on spaces and so on um and things where there's some system functions that are uh overkill powerful and I only need some tiny little uh, subset of their functionality. So I'll wrap them into a little function that uses mm. that. So here, there are a couple of examples here. Um, one called has, which yeah, we'll see where that. I want to see is a regex matched anywhere in um, a text. Yeah. 
So I'm not interested in lots of information about the about the regex matching. And quad S is super powerful, but I can't just have it tell me does this occur at all. I want like membership, but with regex. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. Um. And and so I wrap that because otherwise I have to I have to I want it as a function also. Otherwise, quad S needs to take an operand. It gets all awkward with the syntax. So wrap that to make it really simple. And similarly. Um, something called has ext or has extension, where yeah. uh, I want to see whether a given file path name has an extension. So that is, does it end with dot something something? Yes. Yeah. Right. But after parsing, well, you can't. It's not so simple because maybe there are subdirectories that also have dots in their names, or the file name has multiple dots in it. Those things. So really, if you were to write it in. As APL code, you need to you know, find all the dots and then find the last one and then use that to chop uh, the text and then make sure that there aren't any slashes or backslashes in it. That would be, depending on the operating system, if it's Unixy or or Windows and so on. So you can have dots in a file, in a in directory name. Yeah. So you'd have to, I don't know how you'd check that in APL. Exactly. Well, it can do it. Obviously, you could you could strip up until the last slash or backslash, depending on the operating system. All well, the slashes are important, right? Yeah, and then you can check whether there is a dot in the final name, or yes. you can you can cut on the last dot and see if there are not any slashes in that. How do I know? Because here you're using quad end parts, right? And that's... Right. so that's the thing. So quad end parts splits a name into into the path. And the the main name and the extension, yeah. And all I want to know is, does it have an extension? So I just yes. need to know: is the last of the path, the third part, is it uh, different from? Maybe I should just try this. How do you know the difference between a file called slash tump and a folder called slash tump? You can't. You can't. Oh, but you can know whether it has an extension, which yes. it doesn't. Uh, so that's all you're telling here. Exactly. I see. No, for I that see. you'd have to actually query the file system. Uh, yeah. What, yeah, what okay. type is this? That's a. That's a. But instead of doing this over and over again with, with asking it to go this round, but that's not how I think about it. I just want to know: does it have an extension? I want. I don't yeah. want to think: is the third part of the path when split up <laughs> is it not empty? So, so like primitives and system functions that are missing, I'll write those as utilities. But that's really it. And then there's a thing in Quad S. So Quad S is the regex search, and it can take a, um, it can take a function as right. Uh, operand, which is otherwise the re the replacement or, or, or substitution pattern. So it takes a left pattern, which is what to match, and then a right pattern. So for each each match, it will return some mangling of the matched thing, uh, or it could be verbatim what it found. But it can also take a function, and that function is then given a namespace that contains a bunch of information about the match, and it includes everything but the one thing that I need. <laughs> which is what are the groups so if i have like a regex with multiple uh, parenthesized groups and i want to know what are all the matches for those groups um and it doesn't come with that and that's because of performance that it's potentially costly to compute that on the fly for in the 99 percent of the cases when you don't need it right but i need it in this case and it's the only thing i need in many of these cases i want to see does it have these these patterns. What are these different patterns? And the reason I do that is because I need to um, munge some URLs. Uh, so I like it will take the name of a GitHub repository, and then it will mm. construct the API call to GitHub to to download the zip file and things like that. Yeah. Um, and so I make a function to do that. It would be really awkward to have to rewrite this phrase over and over <laughs> again. Complicated. Yeah. Um, and so that's the kind of things that I use the utility function. Doesn't mean I, I take every phrase of a, of APL. Uh, no, because if we look, look down, we go to these kind of medium sized. What look at one of the manager functions, as it were. One, one no, sorry, manager. one of the job. Oh, the job functions. functions. Okay, so we... so the things that are delegated to. You so see anything here that you port. like? Well, it's just I'm trying to get a an example to read out that is this kind of mix of. Uh, name utility and functions and APL primitives together. Okay, so what would be uh, a good example of? I think I think this. I saw a simple one actually all the way up 
Was it? The bear one? No, actually, maybe it wasn't even in the same place. I saw like a reduce reverse on... You know what? Let's just pick one at random. It doesn't matter. Okay, so so this one, the local workspace one, is somewhat complex thing that's doing. So here the idea yeah, that's is what I was trying to that... avoid. <laughs> okay, you know what that complex one. one. Well, no, just uh... okay. So we can use this. We don't one, need then. to explain everything. Just like one. Okay, so the bear one. That's very very simple. That's when when given a bear okay. name. So get is given a bear name, and uh, it doesn't know what that name means. Okay. Uh, it could be a bunch of different things. Um, and so it will try uh, some things. It will ask uh, salt, which is the traditional uh, simple, well, what is that even? Simple application APL. APL library toolkit or something. That's right. It's, it's basically, it's the, in, in the traditional system of keeping APL code in text files. And it also used to do some, uh, or still, still can do yeah, some the, it, source code being, management. It's being slowly deprecated in yeah. fa uh, with link. But the important thing is that salt has its own search path. So much like you have like a path environment variable on, on all operating systems. That... So it means you, you can try, this is for example, you could load, it was bracket load, wasn't it? And yeah. just pr instead of providing the full file path all the way to where these utilities are kept in the library, it's just, it will look for it for you. Yes, exactly. And so whatever salt does, it has its, whether it's environment variables and settings and things that can be local settings right now, that's a, overriding the global settings between APL yeah. sessions. And, and get doesn't want to re-implement that. So it just asks salt. Oh, yes. Fine. And then, um, so far, so good. That's just a, um, a utility function call from some other namespace to do things. I'm just concatenating the path that was provided with some yeah so salt uh, a simple character vector that's actually the the plain options so salt does the passing of user commands in the side that's API yeah, it's not even it's not well. a user command but whatever it's using that kind of syntax okay command, command line syntax um doesn't matter salt uses dot dialog file extensions so if you yeah. so the idea here is we've got a bare name we don't know what it is it maybe it's http command and then there's something called http command dot dialog in one of the salt paths that it's looking at, and so salt will give us that. Um, and then, but it gives us like a matrix of a bunch of information, and I need to pick out some information from that. And uh, for that, I use APL primitives. Yes. I don't wrap this to say like, oh, these and these columns in this matrix or whatever it is that it returns uh, correspond to this kind of thing. I just say that. raw index into it uh, to get the things. I don't say, I don't, and I, I, I often use this little, I some people don't like it. No, uh, is zero less than the tally of, I often write like just, when I, mean, I know that it has a positive, or non-negative number of elements, I'll just write the the, the signal, the sign of the tally. Uh, the sign of the tally says, are there any in this list? Yeah, but I could have said, right, is non-empty, right? I could have given it a name. Yes, is non-empty gets, and then whatever implementation, be that zero whatever, less than yeah. tally or, or sigma tally. But I don't. I just use the primitives because, like, why would I spell something out with 10 letters when I, it's two characters and to just right that, so there's two things that i notice about your use of primitives in line in these job functions versus the code that you've turned into helpers right. and one thing is the use of primitives is always very small so if, like you say here you've got a two character thing or signum of the tally that's right. notationally telling you, you know, uh, are there any, is, is there any stuff in this list? The way I, th I is think it, of is it, it an is empty sig list? Is signal it of tally, I, th I read, I mean, read it internally. I don't voice it out, but I yeah. say, is there a length? Yes. Right. Is, um, there, is there a length to list? If so, yeah. do this, right? Yeah. And. And then on the other side here, you've got the uh, three characters, um, which is your picked by enclose one, two, and that just says grab elements one and two from lists um, and disclose the items 
from uh, those scalers, isn't it? Get scale, get scalers one and two from list and disclose. No, it's, it's the a context. thing, thing at position one two. Oh, it's a matrix. It's indexed. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I'm not so <laughs> used to. Uh, uh, yeah, because but it's disclosing. So if I did use square right, brackets exactly. there, it wouldn't it wouldn't disclose it. So. Um. Sorry. Yeah. No, that was. But a bit but again, we're talking as moment. you're saying. But you, what you what you're saying is that I'm using three. Uh, three primitives at a time and i write when i when it's actually production code not code golf then i write very vertical airy apl code and and the other thing about your helper functions there's a lot of those are i mean you described it as being there are these system functions and they do quite a lot and only want one thing and that's yeah i guess that is exactly it. it's like our dialog system functions are notoriously a bit esoteric in how how they're called right because they have you know uh usually a vector of arguments and each one like the position of it determines its meaning and you have to go to the help page to figure out what that is or whatever uh or there's like variants or whatever the you know whatever it can be an inline that's annoying uh either if you're using it repeatedly to have to type that all the time that's ridiculous you wouldn't do that or even if you just wrote it once as raw code you'd be then be commenting on top of that um what do each of the pieces mean and, and things like that but by defining it as this helper function with a useful name it's now become just one specific task semantically meaningful Man. uh and not bogged it, it down becomes part of the language right yeah but it has to be very few just like apl has very few uh, so far uh, less than 100 um, primitives and then i i need to be very careful about which words i add so that i can still keep track of them yes so it's just very selectively but those only those that really help i would dare saying this that help me think about the problem mm. so i don't have to think about the the, the nitty-bitty greek details of it of how it's implemented i just want to think on a high level uh what are the matching groups from this regex in this text i don't care about how exactly it does that or does this regex appear anywhere um in this text there's also and, an added benefit that if for some reason you need to change you decide to change the implementation i mean not these examples aren't great because they're so short and you can see that you probably aren't going to although no you did have examples of for uh like well you had i don't know if you wrapped this in any of you did have examples of where some part of dialogue has changed, like salt versus link or whatever. Oh, and I had so, the the I beam, the eight one nine I beam got replaced. Right. With so you, if you write it that way, if yeah, you don't need to change. I mean, again, you wrote this from scratch, and that was actually for compatibility purposes. But in theory, in some other context, if you've got a helper function, or you've got a function that. That, you, that happens to be implemented in terms of one thing, but later you've, some better way to implement it comes along. You don't have to change all your uses of that construct. Right. That kind of thing, I want only one call to, but that's specifically really for I-beams, which are experimental in nature. Uh, no, but in general, you might have right. something that's more complex and you thought of implementing it one way and you uh, wrote a D from the road one way and then later you realize, oh, I could actually do this a different way. Well, I don't want to have to change every place in the code where I've called this, I can just change the definition of a function. I mean, that's just what functions, part of what functions yeah. are for. Um, I don't know how to really avoid that. I've seen some programming languages even, or systems where they'll have like a function name followed by a digit two. It's like, listen, version two <laughs> of this thing. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, I really want to avoid that. That's impossible to think about, right? It's not, I don't associate this numbering of otherwise identically named functions with some specific behavior um, mm. so like imagine if we if we added quad s2 and quad r2 for pcre2 instead of pcre1 right <laughs> that would be really hard to think about oh which one am i going to use uh we do have some examples where like deprecate or yeah some reasons uh but then it'll generally have very different names but the like one that bothers me is we've got uh, quad n erase for removing oh, uh, yeah. files, and then quad n delete for very much the same purpose. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Huh. It's just that quite any race is the old one, and it's really clunky to use. It takes the tie number and everything. Doesn't yeah, it? you have to tie the file, and then you have to uh, also provide the file path as well. Exactly, to as be a, safe as a security measure, so you don't delete things by mistake. And people aren't as careful with files, I guess, these days, and so quite and delete. <laughs> just takes and, the file path. Yeah, it can also delete many things at once. It won't and, and delete, delete it if it is tied though, because they'll have a lock on it, which is funny. Oh no, you will untie it and and uh, and yeah. So I mean, yeah, for that file tie system, it's it's great. You can't use it to, to delete directories either because you can't tie a directory. Uh, okay. So a create and delete is more powerful. It can do like recursive deletion of directory trees. Anyway, um, yeah, and you can see I have, I'm using like things like membership will not because there's no not member off in APL, and that I'll just spell out in APL. No reason to to write that. Yeah. Um, but then it will also call other um, action functions if necessary. So in, the, in this case, we, we took the bare one because it looked simple, but really what's happening is it figures out what type of thing is it we're dealing with, and then it calls something else potentially to, um, but yeah, it will also always call something else yeah. to get the actual work done um, in case, yeah. It, Yes. So, so, uh, so I think I think this is a good example of of how a structure thing. You don't you didn't want to do look at the the local workspace or local file one. I mean, I don't want to turn this into let's uh, the the get. No, no, let's it, go through the whole of get. No, but you can you can episode. but you hear with the local file one. Just the, we don't just go through the code, but you can if you quickly spot there's a lot. Oh, of, the two lines that you're looking at right now. Well, there's some there's some various primitives there. There's a an inner function that uses an anonymous defin inside with a bunch of alphas and omegas and, and is doing something very specific that I need here and not need anywhere else. And I'll just spell it out inside as primitives. Right. As an as anonymous defin with prim lots of primitives inside. Right? So it, I'm not afraid of having the, the primitives there. So omega prepend uh, file colon slash slash if um it's not found at the beginning of the and the path. end if we need it that i'm using a power operator to say if if at all oh, needed. all right otherwise. yep sorry i was looking inside the defen yeah so so i i think this is a nice way of structuring things we like the hotel analogy um with layers until we actually get to the rooms where things are getting done yeah uh, maybe a factory analogy would be better um, yeah. doing, I'm going to stop sharing this. Um, for, yeah, medium-sized tasks. It's still kind of monolithic in the sense it's a single namespace with, with things. If you're right, writing but that... a giant system, I would structure it in multiple namespaces. Each of them is are like modules. Yeah, A, so. that's because of the old user command system. And B, sometimes that's done just for the convenience of shipping some code as a single file. Yes, that's true. That's that's the like case it. for some of the utilities we ship. So Jarvis and HTTP command. Yeah. Um, that's true. But how do you think about this? How do you think about the code? This is all how I wrote it. Yeah. Hmm? And if it, yeah. And uh, I think in the in my mind, I kind of have these these blobs of connected blobs of things that are dealing with each other. Um, right. I'm thinking about the, it was during a packages workshop at the dialogue user meeting. I think early on someone's like, maybe Brian asked, what's a define a, can someone define a package? And, uh, <laughs> one person there had a really nice, uh, succinct thing that was just like a collection of code that performs one specific task. Um, okay. Yeah. Because. But the test could have many different um, details to it, right? Right. So, in a sense, get doesn't make a great package because it does lots, maybe too many things. But it's all, they're all one thing. What about HTTP command? Is that, is that the package? HTTP command. That makes HTTP requests. Sure, but it can do them in all kinds of ways. Right, oh, right, actually, exactly. It, it, That's yeah. Um, 
But forget, well, okay, what I was thinking of was, you said, how do you think about this? And I'd started early on by talking about, like, um, having an algorithm that you might solve, and then on the other end, the user-facing thing. When we thought about get, it was like, the problem to solve was, when I want to load something into dialog, <laughs> there are umpteen different... Yeah, that's true. System commands and there. different <laughs> things. You know, it's like, do I quad load this? Do I quad CY it? Do I bracket um, load? Pick quad and get. Do I tie <laughs> a file and do this? Do I bracket load it? Yeah, even if you're not using a, the the API, well, the APL system functions or whatever. You know, even if you're using the convenient system commands or use the commands, it's like, which one am I using? Why? Why are there so many things? So we're trying to simplify that. But then the design part of how you think about the structure of get as an application is well you've got all these types these types of things you want to bring in so i guess i don't know is that how you started with it like i mean yes it was one, born let's out bring of... in one type of thing and then <laughs> no no it was, it, was brought, it was born out of the frustration with us many <laughs> different ways of loading stuff yeah um and didn't they do a presentation on this at a like at a user meeting or something uh, there's definitely a yeah, webinar as well. Maybe I think you wrote it and I gave it because you couldn't do it. Um, um, yeah, but but then but it doesn't really matter because the the implementation is still it's a system that takes some input and then chooses to do something. Or is it? Or is how how we think about it in terms of like uh, yeah, well we started conceptually and then we talked about the implementation because the other thing that's interesting obviously is that it's all APL code, isn't it? Yeah. Or, you know, it's it has to be expressed in terms of code that's executable. But well, well first I've crystallized in my mind what do I want? I don't think in terms in terms of what can I do. Yes. What do you want? So, yeah, there's a need, right? Or a job description from a manager or something. <laughs> and and then and then I, I tend to just start coding. It might all be scrapped eventually. But yeah, as we express what I want in APL, translating my thoughts to to this notation. That's very much a tool of thought for me. Like, can I express myself clearly to somebody else? Can I express myself clearly to the interpreter using this language that we mutually speak? And then... Sorry, I'm just thinking a minute. Don't want too much dead space. Um... That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, I think I'm the same it's pretty useful to be able to throw things away and, and try something different in the early stages when you're developing before you've decided okay i know how this is going to work now i know what the lower level pieces are and i'm at least aware or if it's not been described formally of what the user facing start a uh, user facing part should look like and then gluing those pieces together the hardest part is usually the part at the bottom uh where you're solving the core problem or you know in, in the case of get it was like uh deciding how you know constructing the api calls fetching the thing and uh well there i had to cut, in... cut out for me very much because i had to fit into an existing framework that's true that's true if we think more uh no do we need to think more abstractly or just a different example the um Yeah, the harder part, the hardest part is usually solving the problem itself, the the fulfilling the meeting the need, and you might iterate that on a few times. But after you just start coding, right? Right. Okay. You start coding, try to solve the problem. After you've solved the problem once, you usually think of a better way to do it. Sometimes part way through, <laughs> you forget you save your code, and then you have to write it over, and it becomes better next time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, right? Yeah, it's one thing that feels all right to do. 
in APL is really quite nice. It's just to start over. <laughs> you only save yourself a few hundred key presses anyway, if you have to write it <laughs> over. Right? Um, and it saves you a bit later on when you, you're not sort of stuck dragging mistakes that you've uh, made earlier. Sometimes that happens anyway, because you're trying to get something out the door and you don't think that it's going to stick around. <laughs> oh yeah. It always does. Every prototype becomes permanent eventually. <laughs> The other thing uh, that I kind of wanted to, I don't know whether we just stop this here and start, save it for next time. Maybe I'll just allude to it and they can save it as a, as a spoiler teaser. or something, a <laughs> teaser, um, was that we're thinking about this in terms of uh, code, like in the language that we're writing all of the code in, but that's not always have to, how you have to think about structuring programs. Or you wouldn't have, or people have thought about doing, writing programs in other ways because um, this is all an evolution from. Actually, it's an evolution from punch cards. That was another talk that I watched fairly Wait, recently. I should, I should find that to reference. Are you making the connection to punch cards? Right, because so this was the connection the guy in the talk made was you start uh, programming was done on punch cards for a long time. And those were like 80 characters wide. And then you had, and those were literal holes punched in that had the instructions of what to do. And then the uh, programming languages were on these text-based terminals, but those were the same kind of linear, do this, then do this. I guess what's that really derived from at the end hmm. of the day? Is I, the, think, I think... It's mixing up things, but maybe we should think, wait, wait to another is. time. I think yeah, I think I it was my thoughts together first. <laughs> I think I think it was came from actually getting work done. The, the if some of the earliest, if not the earliest, actual programming was looms, weaving machines, and and the punch cards or holes or tapes or whatever were literally um, slots where different feelers in the machine would fall into those holes and that had a cascading effect of moving various arms up and down and making it weave certain patterns. So by putting a pattern into oh, punch cards yes, then right. or punch strips and then, then then it would move in, in a in a patterned way. Um and that's but, it's very parallel to what programming is on a very low level. Yeah, that's more like the that's uh, the individual transformations or something super low level. Isn't yes, it? like but, a but, but in a, it's low level, but on the other hand, it's also high level because I'm pretty sure people with designers would think in terms of this then. They see these patterns and they just, they write them down directly to these punched holes yes. and a machine just does it. But then, and you could actually kind of do programming like this, um, but then the the loom aspect of it was removed, and it became just the code, yeah. changing internal states without having a physical manifestation of it. And at that point, it became low level again. It, it was high level. It was the pattern directly written as holes, and then it became just the code itself. And then well, people started making because at that point you're no longer right. The loom is a is a machine for weaving patterns on fabric but that's not what we wanted to do with this <laughs> no. uh paradigm anymore right we wanted to right. weave patterns in in memory <laughs> oh yeah on, on metal discs <laughs> or whatever with uh weave magnetic fields onto metal discs so <laughs> that's what we were doing except we didn't have any aesthetic value of the discs themselves <laughs> And there's no there's no direct correspondence between the code and its effects, as opposed to with the loom, where it's a very one to one mapping. Right, but then they got turned. It's this linearization of it really turned into this thing where there's a line of words on a terminal. That's where APL's code has evolved from. Right, and so it's this everything must be written in terms of lines of text ordered in rows, executed one row at a time. But a Unless lot of things are... Parallel, uh, well, okay, that, I mean, it's coming back to maybe be important with concurrent things if there's a nicer 
way of expressing concurrency than and i don't mean in terms of programming language features i mean in terms of literally writing down the thought of do these things and then collect i don't know i'm still thinking about it in those terms we'll, go, we'll come back Concurrency's to that. hard we'll come back to that yeah. um but even yeah uh thinking about structuring no sorry thinking about doing some uh anything really because people right we're trying to solve problems in domains outside of just shuffling bits we just happen to be using the computers to do it and people write diagrams of all kinds of things um in a way that's not just top down writing i think oh an example from that same talk again we'll come back to this next time when i gather my thoughts properly uh was the krebs cycle i think in in biology yeah. um that's the one about energy isn't it getting energy your muscles uh atp converting chemicals but it's a, this cycle and it's not nicely you know it's it's nicely written as a diagram in a circle with arrows and it's not like nicely expressed as a um recipe food recipe style instruction set that's often the analogy given for algorithms isn't it because it goes around and around rather than from from, from yeah. raw product to, to finished product you saying yeah and even a lot of applications don't follow recipe that nicely I mean, as soon as you have a loop, right? Yeah, exactly. Like if you have an outer loop. Um, loop, combinations of things where you do want to do all of them, not just give the options of doing all of them. Um, okay, let's get back to that um, another time. Because we are definitely an hour. Uh, hour, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the listener can probably hear us uh, running out of steam <laughs> as we get to this point we begin to ramble okay so yes. thank, thank you so much for richard for joining me it's been awesome we'll continue another time